it's it's very interesting to me because I hear a lot of people um, talking about this legislation when in, in those circles that I would uh, move around in. As a sore optimist, we, they have been discussing this law and how this regulation is and what it requires them to do. And there's some um, um, trepidation on the part of persons who feel that you know, uh, this uh, kind of regulation of nonprofit organizations would really stymie the work that NPOs are going to be doing and the type of, um, and how they're going to function. And it's a really big cost factor involved in complying with the legislation. So I just wanted to um, bring some, some light in. Let me just give a, a, a little caveat first. Um, I am here, even though I was introduced as Senator Jayanti Lashmiyal, um, I am not here in my political capacity. I am here strictly as, um, as an attorney and as someone who has worked with anti-money laundering. Um, so nothing that I say here is a political view or it is, um, please do not hold it against me in political arenas or forum. And I do not represent the views of the UNC or any other party or any political view while I'm here. So that's just a caveat that I wanted to give. So let's just start off a little bit about this. Um, I don't have a very detailed um, uh, presentation because I prefer to talk than to put a lot of information up on slides. But let me just give you a little bit of the background to this. Why is it necessary? When you hear nonprofit organization, you think something good. These are a group of civic-minded individuals, community-driven people who want to get together and do something for society at large, whether it's education, whether it's um, charity work, whether it's sports, culture, whatever it is, it's a good thing. So why would you want to bring um, laws into effect that would essentially um, you know, impose a, a burden, so to speak, on organizations such as these? Now, and I think it's important for us to understand the why before we understand the how. And the why really is that, and it starts a long time ago with 9-11. 9-11 changed the way that the world saw nonprofit organizations because of the financing of terrorism. And it started with firstly, people just being able to abuse nonprofit organizations. I don't know if anyone has ever seen, um, there was a series, I can't remember what station it was on, or if it was Netflix called Sleeper Cell. And that, that show explained exactly what happened in 9-11. It basically said that you can have people who are, and they call them homegrown terrorists. Now, again, I'm just, I'm just giving you the background here. This is not my personal view or anything like that. I know that people have lots of theories about 9-11. But when you have a situation where people can come into a country and they live and they function and they attend schools and they are financed in such a way that they can put themselves into a country, a city, uh, uh, anywhere, um, and they are financed through different mechanisms. And one of those mechanisms are charitable organizations. Um, and what they do is they basically plot, plan, and sometimes they sit, that's why they call them sleepers, they sleep for a month, two months, six months, a year, while they plan major terrorist attacks. And this is coming out of 9-11. This is what they saw happening. This is what the world came to terms with, that, listen, everybody who is raising funds um, it's not to buy wheelchairs and school books and give out hampers and so on. It's actually sometimes meant to fund terrorism. It can also be used for money laundering. And now the new angle that um, they have found that these types of financial crimes are feeding into the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Um, that sounds like a big word. All it means is that it's financing people who are seeking to develop chemical and biological warfare. And they use nonprofit organizations, large nonprofit organizations, to um, be able to raise funds to do these things. So, again, um, and and I make I, I don't want to cast any aspersions on anybody, but sometimes you see these things where um, you need to um, help support children who are suffering in a war-torn country, like I'm just saying Syria. And everybody wants to collect money and help these children. And of course, you put a starving child on a poster and everybody's ready to dip into their pockets to go and give. But where's the money actually going? And that's why it's important. Now, we can't examine everybody who's giving. So what the law does and what the, the world has decided that they are going to do is you're going to examine the conduit, the channel through which this money is going. And that is the nonprofit organization. So the Financial Action Task Force, which is headquarters, headquartered in Paris, 
what they have done is they have developed recommendations for countries to deal with money laundering and the financing of terrorism. And they have also um, now added pro proliferation on uh, financing, prolifer pro proliferation of weapons of mass destruction uh, has now been added to that. And every country in the world is assessed based on their compliance with the FATF recommendations. So nonprofit organizations are actually just one of 40 recommendations. Um, what are the implications? And again, this is the, the compliance with nonprofit organizations act, the passage of this law and the actual compliance and enforcement of the law. It's bigger than you, it's bigger than me, it's bigger than your cricket club, it's bigger than your dance school, it's bigger than your, your, um, your whatever community organization. This is a national issue that will feed into a global issue. So the global issue is terrorism. The national issue is if we do not comply and if we are assessed, and Trinidad and Tobago is assessed very regularly. I was actually part of the, the fourth round assessment. I worked at the FIU then, and it's a grueling assessment that you go through in terms of other countries, people from other countries actually come in here and they assess how well is Trinidad and Tobago, the government, the FIU, the central bank, the SEC, everybody who has a part to play in this um, in this whole AML CFT regime. How well are you doing? How are your laws performing? How is your judiciary performing in terms of dealing with matters that are brought before the court? It's a really thorough, thorough assessment. And if you get a bad grade on that assessment, the implications can be from very small as like being put on what we call the gray list and all of those things so that they are watching you um, to, to if you are completely blacklisted or people find that you are too high risk, you will have a situation where other countries in the world don't want to do business with you. There was actually a point in time um, around 2009 or so when we had to get our act together very quickly, establish a FIU, pass laws, um, get people registered and start doing monitoring and supervision and all of those things like overnight because, uh, I mean, they literally spent an entire night in parliament getting it done. I remember in 2014 or something, we spent about two, two or three in the morning in parliament getting the legislation through parliament, getting it passed. Um, some amendments that needed to be done because we could have been blacklisted and blacklisting or, or, or getting a very negative rating for the country means that um, you literally will not be able to use your credit card on certain websites because certain banks in the United States will enter and Tobago, I'm not doing business with anybody from there and your credit card is like of no value. So think about how, um, how, how massive the repercussions could be. And that's why the trickle down effect of that now is that every single person who's operating as a nonprofit organization in Trinidad Tobago should make an effort to comply with this law. I, I make no comment on whether it's a good law or a bad law or whether what I would like to see in the law and so on. Um, what, it is the law. That is the fact of the matter. And trying your best to comply with it is, um, I think, the responsible thing that everyone should do. And I encourage everybody to do it. So I'm really happy to see that we have so many people participating and that so many people are, are interested in this and that they want to comply. Now, um, when the law was first passed, there were some deadlines in place for registration and so on. Uh, those deadlines have been extended until the end of March of this year because of the fact that, um, well, with COVID, it has had an impact on people's ability to do certain things. So let's run through what the act really says. The act really just says that anybody who is an NPO must be registered. What is a nonprofit organization? Well, it's very widely defined in the act. I asked them to share the legislation in the chat with you all. So I hope everybody has a copy of it. And essentially, um, we have gone with the FATF type definition of anybody that's established for a number of things. You can be patriotic, religious, philanthropic, charitable, educational, cultural, and so on. And then you go on to hear that it's these bodies, um, they raise and disburse funds. That's a key factor in a nonprofit organization. You are not just um, like getting together to do I don't know, have chats and have tea or whatever, but you're actually raising money for a cause because that's the root of the issue with nonprofit organizations. You're collecting money and then you're going to be dispersing this money and how you use this money and how you disperse the money is really the key factor that they are interested in. And there's no pecuniary gain for its members. So if the, a group of people get together normally and they each have one share in a company, at the end of the day, you, whatever money is made out of, um, you throw a barbecue, you, you have a raffle, whatever it is, it's shared amongst the members. The point of the, um, 
of a nonprofit organization is that the members don't actually make any gain from it. So that's not um, something that you would see in a nonprofit organization. So the law is meant to comply with FATF requirements. And that's why we have the definition of nonprofit organizations being so, because you're meant to everyone. Because what if ask countries to do the adequacy of your laws and regulations um, and any uh, country being vulnerable to terror saying no believe it or not we are actually vulnerable to terror in Trinidad because we've had instances of persons um for example you know just um collecting monies is abroad um people who convicted of terrorism um actually uh assets in Trinidad and on and that has caused us to become so, as we say sometimes, you know, a few people, a few bad people make it bad for everybody. That's essentially what happens to us there. Um, they ask that countries apply focused and proportionate measures in line with the approach of the risk being identified. So what it is, and, and that's what to do. So passing the law is just the first step. Uh, law must actually go into looking at a proportionate way to regulate these entities, how regulation is necessary. As I said before, Nobody wants to overregulate community organization. That's really good work. Nobody wants to over and drive a community organization out of business because they are doing good work. And you know what I've heard when we first introduced laundering measures against all our businesses, um, these are actually for profit businesses, but they have things that they have to comply with. And they're small businesses like jewelry and vehicle dealers and so on. I jumped up and said, Oh, this is going to send me out of business. I cannot comply. It is so complicated. It is going to costly and on. So why? that's why you have to have this focus approach because you don't want to um, force people out of, the, out of business. So that's what we come to in a little while called risk-based approach. A risk-based approach is um, really you focus your resources on the highest risk. It's approach at the country and at the organization. When I say I mean your individual organizations, right? At the country level, what they say is you identify which organizations have the highest risk and you supervise them, you monitor, monitor them, you make the targets um, those types of organizations. Um, let me give you an example again. As I'm a Sir Optimist, Sir Optimist started off as a small group of women who got together to start redwood trees in California. It is now a... a, 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 a organization that can um you know it's all over the world there are different um federation thousands and thousands and thousands of members can you imagine how much money? because of course that started 100 last 100 years we've grown to be huge can you imagine the amount of money that goes through an organization such as this on a if we decided say that we want to get together um fun terrorism or fun of a uh um, research into biological or chemical weapon, we can have a really big impact. Pair that to a cricket club in Mois Rural. It's just not the same level of risk involved. Not that the cricket carries a lot of money, but it's just not the same risk. So you, at, as a country, I to do, and this is what Jeff is saying, look at the level that's involved across the board from all of your energy and monitor um, and enforce the law to, right? At the level of the organization, you are required the same thing. You are required essentially at every transaction that you're, look at every a patron of your organization, every fundraiser and how you donate. Look at the causes the, the that you adopt and what makes you ask and then you, you operate and I'll ask for some of the things do um, later on in the present when you adopt um, a compliance approach in, in line with what the legislation requires you. So you're looking at um, any organization that can pose a threat um, to be infiltrated by a terrorist organization, um, look at ways that um, organizations can escape 
asset freezing measures and so on, and you are looking at ways that you can divert funds away from a legitimate purpose towards a terrorist organization. And that's where the focus has to be, right? NPO abuse, as I already said, it's all about money laundering, terrorist financing, and now the prol proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. That's the concern that we really have when it comes to NPOs. So the fact of definition is um, pretty straightforward, legal personal arrangement organization engaging in raising or disbursing funds. And they list a few of them. Our organization is the one on the, well, on the right of my screen, um, coming straight out of the legislation that basically says um, it's, they have incorporated quite a lot of persons. They've made it very specific to persons um, who, clubs and so on, where there's no actual pecuniary gain for the owners. And it restricts the use of the profits to the promotion of its purpose or object. So there's no, um, there's no capturing of entities that's really going to be able, that are going to have to, um, that uh, serve the purposes of their members. And that's one of the reasons why friendly societies have actually been excluded from this legislation. Um, one of the documents I shared with you, which I thought was quite good, is um, something that was prepared by the Registrar General's Department in relation to registration. And it makes it very clear that a society under the Friendly Societies Act is exempt from registration. The reason being that a friendly society is different from a nonprofit. A friendly society is a group of people who get together to literally be friendly to each other. They pool their resources. And if somebody's in a, a state of need, you reach out to them and you help them and, and so on. So it's like, a, it's like a really nice group of friends that just get together and help each other out financially in essence. And we don't really have that many of them anymore, but they are exempted because they don't fall within this definition. Another aspect of registration that I think it's important for us to understand and to know, if you have been incorporated under the Companies Act as a, as a, a non-profit and not-for-profit company, you are already deemed registered. So there's no escaping this, and there, but there's also no need to go and re-register. You are already registered and all you need to do is to start compliance. Uh, many people don't know because they join um, age old um, institutions, like some of our Seroptimist clubs, um, which were incorporated many, many moons ago in the 60s and so on, when it was um, actually popular to become incorporated by Act of Parliament. So you would have a private bill being brought to the Parliament and you're incorporated by Act of Parliament. Seroptimist International, of course, Spain, I think, is one of those. Um, I believe San Fernando as well. The newer clubs, like my club, Esperance, we incorporated under the Companies Act. So we are already deemed to be registered in this um under this law and we must move forward from there so in order to understand the obligations as as a non-profit organization you have to know what the laws are that regulate anti-money laundering and financing of terrorism these are very detailed i can't go through all of them but let me just give you an idea of what they are proceeds of crime act basically says what are the proceeds of crime and it creates the offense of money laundering that's the primary thing. There are other things as well that you can seize cash if you have too much cash in your um, household and they can go to the court. They, they develop um, funds whereby you can forfeit funds from, the, from organizations that are deemed to be involved in money laundering. That's a lot of legal stuff that's very complicated. For your purposes, the proceeds of crime is any money generated from a crime. And what we did is we've amended the law so that you don't have to identify a specific crime. It's actually... Once you cannot, once you can prove to a court that, or you have a suspicion that the money is generated from crime, it, the money is, can be deemed to be the process of crime. Of course, there are evidential issues and all of that there, and I'm not, that's again, very legal. So my phone is here. Marcus steals my phone and he sells it and he has that money. That's the proceeds of crime. If he uses those proceeds of crime to come and patronize uh, or donate it, and he's been stealing phones all over the country and selling them and then taking that money to support a charitable organization that's meant for the upliftment of women and children, then he's essentially infiltrated a nonprofit organization to launder the proceeds of his crime. Because what people do, and this is, and this is real, this is very, very real. What they will do is that they will form an NGO and they will um, utilize the proceeds of their crime through the NGO in such a way that there's a benefit that rolls back to them. So for they will probably, um, they may own a property. And what they do is they fund this NGO and said, listen, you all need a headquarters. Um, I am going to donate. I'm donating. I'm donating to what I'm donating to use the proceeds of my crime, eh? whether it's corruption, thief and phone, um, a whole bandit holding up people, whatever it is. It's proceeds of crime. It's not money that was legitimately earned. 
I'm funneling it through you now as this NGO that I have established and you're going to rent my building from me or from my partner, my uncle, my cousin, whoever it is. So there's a benefit that comes back to me. So I am essentially laundering my dirty money through your organization. That's proceeds of crime in a nutshell for NPO purposes. The anti-terrorism act, um, that, that, re that recommendation came in because of terrorism and the role that NPOs were um, playing in, ter in terrorist financing. So financing of terrorism, just like money laundering, every regulated entity in Trinidad and Tobago, it started with the financial institutions, the banks, credit unions, um, you know, things like merchant banks and all of that. Then we have what we call designated non-financial businesses and professions, lawyers, accountants, jewelers, real estate agents, um, casinos, all of them also regulated now. And then we've gone beyond that and we've included NPOs. So when I say the regulated sectors, I'm talking about all of these people. So all of these people now and NPOs have joined the, the queue of all of these other businesses that have to be regulated and have to ensure that monies just like dirty money could be washed and passed through and come back to the criminal who uh, or the drug dealer whoever it is in order to um in order to finance themselves and to gain a benefit um they can likewise use the npo to fund terrorism so you set up a, a, a um a charity that is meant to assist starving children in venezuela and what the money is really going to venezuela to do is to bring in guns and drugs through citrus simple example right um and you are actually having people here who feel sorry for starving children funding your drug trade or your gun trade right the fiu act establishes the fiu it gives the fiu a, a wide range of functions from actually you know analyzing suspicious transactions and so on and but there's a, another aspect of the act which is relevant to NPOs, which is the supervision aspect under the Nonprofit Organization Act, the FIU is designated as a supervisor. It is in part four of the act, which is um, shared with you. And it says the FIU shall be the regulator. So even though your registration process, um, if, you are not, if you are not incorporated in companies that can you incorporated some other way or you are an unincorporated entity and you're just a group of people who get together and you're chartered like a Rotary Club or something like that, you have to become registered with the Registrar General's department. But then the FIU is the one who will exercise the actual supervisory function. So I will run through Section 18 of the FIU Act, and I think I will probably... Um, now, the problem with some of these laws is they've been amended many times, and we don't really have consolidated vision. So even for me as a lawyer, I have a hard time reading it. But I will share the basic outline of it with... Um, with the institute here and ask them to share it around with participants as well but i'll tell you about what the powers of the fiu are as a regulator and what they can do what the fiu does in relation to npos and also a lot of the other professions that are regulated and, and businesses like jewelers and motor vehicle dealers and so on is essentially what central bank does with the banks they come in they look at your operations and they make sure that you are complying with the law and you're doing what you have to do um, so that you are not at risk of becoming or of facilitating, that you aren't actually deliberately facilitating or that you aren't at risk of facilitating money laundering or financing of terrorism. And of course, the Companies Act, you need to be familiar with it because a lot of NPOs are now incorporated as non-for-profit um, organizations. The controller, this is a very important person and this person has been given a really wide range of functions in this piece of legislation. Um, a lot of times when you have an NPO being set up, really, as I said, it's a group of people who want to get together and do something good. So nobody really is the leader. There's no CEO in a, in a nonprofit organization. I mean, yes, clubs have presidents and you have an executive and you elect people, but not everybody's so organized. The, the cricket team, I really like cricket, so you'll hear me say cricket always. The cricket team does just have a captain, right? And, and you might have a treasurer and he's collecting money and, and go on you know, ask people for money in the area and businessmen and so on. And, but there's no formal structure. You are required now, if you are going to be a nonprofit organization, you're going to be raising money from the public to have a controller. And the controller can be anyone. It can be a director of the company. It can be a trustee if you are established by way of a trust. It could just be the person responsible for the management or, or administration of the body. So if you have a manager at the cricket club, he could be the, the controller. 
um, any senior officer of the club, the treasurer, um, some other person. And um, what the act actually goes on to say is that a person not specified in those previous paragraphs or described there where it is controlled or managed by a person. So basically anybody who's exercising that managerial um, function in relation to the organization can be the controller. When you become registered under the act, it is important that you name a controller. They are not going to register you unless you have a controller you must have that person and the reason for that is that it is important to designate someone as being the responsible person as being the person who is going to um be the point of contact and who will take responsibility that's why the law actually in section 19 disqualifies certain people from being the controller of the nonprofit organization because you can't just have any and everybody doing this and um this is actually a feature of many of our laws uh we do not allow certain people to hold certain offices within companies and certain types of organizations simply because they ought not to be um they ought not to hold positions such as that so under section 19 of the nonprofit organizations act obviously if you're found guilty of any offense on a process of crime or anti-terrorism generally speaking you cannot be in an npo um any offense involving dishonesty such as fraud because of course you have a lot of fraud taking place through these um non-profit organizations as well they just basically defraud people of their money it's not necessarily that you take any money to fund terrorism or anything it's just you know you're just greedy and you're taking money from people for no reason um if you're a designated entity under the anti-terrorism act a designated entity means someone who is um a known designated terrorist on an international list uh, we do have some of them in Trinidad and Tobago, actually. The law provides that you go to court here in Trinidad when someone who is a Trinidadian national who has links to this country. And um, so that's something you need to check. If you have an NPO, make sure that nobody in your NPO is a designated person under the law. It is published on the FIU website. Um, it's important as an NPO now that you check your membership and that you make sure, especially if you're a large organization, um, you know, people always say, well, no, nobody that I know would be involved in terrorism or be designated. Well, what if the person is very closely affiliated to someone who has actually been named and who has actually been um, designated? That's something you're going to want to know, right? Because you that's a risk factor. When we get into the risk-based approach and all of that, you need to understand how something as simple as the person sitting next to you in your little club meeting can actually bring risk into your organization because they are affiliated with someone or they are part of an organization another organization that might have a particular designation um so and then of course the basic requirements again for a controller who must be over 18 must be mentally um not ill under the mental health act and so on and you must not be bankrupt because of course people who are um deemed bankrupt by law and um, there's actually a legal mechanism in place to declare someone bankrupt um you wouldn't want them having control of an organization and monies are coming in and going out of it's just simply not um not really crucial to have that right so the the thing about it and and before i move on to the role of the fiu section 23 of the act talks about the liability of the controller so when you decide and i i'm thinking that one of many of you here um might have been nominated as the person to attend this seminar because you have a leadership type role in your respective organizations and um if you are going to be the controller when this organization is registered and when you file your documents and so on with the company's registry uh it's important for you to understand that if you knowingly or recklessly provide false documents, accounts, records, audited accounts, and so on to the act, you commit an offense and you are liable to a fine of $50,000 and imprisonment for seven years. That is how important the role of the controller is because you are the person that the state looks to to keep the affairs of this business in order. You are the person that when the FIU comes in to ask you, are you complying? Are you doing your audits? Are you doing X, Y, and Z? um it's your responsibility so of course the, the law is is um worded in such a way that you must knowingly or recklessly meaning that you must do it deliberately or you must be reckless as to whether or not what you are providing to the regulator is correct um and that's again a kind of a, a legal thing but it means you have to just in layman's terms you have to be very careful you have to be extremely careful with what you're doing um because you cannot simply say well all right i'm the controller and um they're gonna give me a little money to do this job and um yeah let me go go ahead and just be controller 
it is a responsibility on you. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying this to discourage anybody from being a controller. I'm saying it can't be that um, in a club, for example, that the con- person nominated to be the controller is just by way of rotation and everybody gets a chance to be the controller. That can't work because it's a serious responsibility. It is. And at the end of the day, your entire organization can fall and become the subject of a criminal investigation if you do not actually um, have someone responsible doing this, doing this thing, All right? And it says any controller who knowingly or rec- recklessly authorizes, acquiesces in, permits a contravention of the act um, constitutes an offense and um, again, can be punished, um, well, accordingly, unless otherwise specific, specifically provided. So as a controller, if you turn a blind eye to someone doing something within your organization, you can also be held accountable. So this role of a controller, I think one of the first conversations that every organization, apart from getting your registration sorted out and all of that, the first conversation that every NPO needs to have in this country is who is going to be nominated as our controller what is the process of vetting this person? Are we going to have this as a rotational thing? Are we going to, um, uh, I, I don't know what else you can possibly look at at this point in time. Uh, do, uh, you know, what kind of money are we going to invest in training this person? That's important. And I will get to that because I know that the cost factor here is, is big. Um, but you know, it actually is important. If you do not have a competent person within your organization who can fulfill this role, you do need to develop those competencies. Um, and it's not hard. It's actually not hard at all, you know. Um, it sounds more complicated than it is, but it's, it's, um, it's not really that difficult. Let's just talk quickly about the role of the FIU as the regulator. What the app provides for is that the FIU must regulate any NPO with a gross annual income of over $500,000. This comes back to the risk-based approach that I was talking about that the country must take. The country would have undertaken a national risk assessment and they are always looking at risks and so on and decided to set the bar at $500,000 of gross annual income. They've also defined gross annual income in relation to an NPU, meaning, uh, you know, income derived from different sources like donations, grants, loans, um, if you have property, if you have um, the provision of goods and services, if you rent, rent out a property and you earn income from it, any in any one financial year, if you cross five hundred thousand dollars, then the FIU will have you um, on their list of people that they need to supervise. Um, and they say, and in relation to all NPOs, they have the powers given under the FIU Act or um, any other law actually that you can um, that that gives the FIU power because the FIU does have certain powers under the Process of Crime Act and the Anti Terrorism Act, as I would have spoken to before. But the main power that we need to be concerned about, and for you as an NPO is the role of the FIU as the supervisory authority. And this is found in section 18A, sections 18A to um, basically 18H of the FIU Act that talks about all the powers of the FIU and what they can do. The act, that section starts off with two basic definitions and it says it's about monitoring and supervisory authority. What does it mean to be the supervisory authority? It means that in relation to all, and they said here listed businesses, which is what I talk, spoke, to, spoke about before, the non-financial businesses and the professions, lawyers, um, accountants, motor vehicle dealers, and so on. You are the supervisory authority in relation to those people, but now you, the FIU is also the supervisory authority in relation to nonprofit organizations. And monitor simply means observe the person or the entity for compliance with this law. What are they allowed to do? Um, in certain circumstances, they have to register. For NPOs, they don't register, though you are registered with the Register General's Department. They have the power to actually enter your business and come in and observe your operations and see how well you are doing in terms of your compliance with the law. They can inspect and take documents. They can uh, inspect the premises. They can observe how you conduct your business. They can take copies of your documents. Um, they can actually ask a police officer to get a warrant to come in and take copies of your documents if they find something is on the wall. They can check the premises and so on. Um, so the police can actually come in and they can do it. You can take administrative sanctions. And recently, as, a, as in very late last year, this law was amended to give the FIU the power to actually come in now and impose financial penalties against people who do not comply. 
So they have a process. In place. I'm not sure exactly if it's the same process. When I was there, how we did it is that if you find a, an organization doing something that they ought not to be doing, they can see you a warning letter. They can follow up. They can ask you to take um, corrective action. And if you don't do it, they can actually have a hearing and they can impose a sanction against you. Um, of note is that the Nonprofit Organizations Act allows the Registrar General to revoke your registration. So if you are not um, complying with the requirements, and the FIU, for example, says, and this is where the synergies um, come in, the synergies between all these different organizations come in, it's that you really have to um, have these the organs of the state working together um, to do certain things. So your registration... If I may, if someone has their... Um their microphone unmuted and it's providing some feedback and the presentation has been distorted. So can you guys just un... Thank you. Yeah, if anybody... Okay. We'll stay unmuted until we're ready to do that. Your registration as a non-profit organization under Section 7 comes up for renewal every five years. And when you apply for, um, for, for a renewal, for example, one of the things that they might actually be able to look at is whether or not the FIU has found that you are not in compliance and they may actually not renew your registration. So your whole existence um, as a nonprofit organization can be threatened if you do not actually um, comply with the law. The Registrar General can also um, cancel your registration at any time. And the act actually lists out very clearly here um, what are some of the things that can lead to the cancellation of your of your registration under Section 10? Not keeping your proper records, um, not submitting your audited financials. Uh, if it is that you have breached your your duty to your contributors, if you are um, in a proven in a court of law, of course, committed some sort of criminal offence, um, carrying a term of more than three years, any crime under the process of Crime Act or Anti Terrorism Act or FIU Act, obviously. So, if for example, you have a a crime being committed on the FIU Act, then you definitely uh, are for non-compliance and you are sanctioned, then you can um, you can be um, automatically cancelled. And if you are designated as a terrorist organization, etc., if you are a company that's struck, because you know the company and the Companies Act, you can also be struck off from the company's registry if you aren't doing what you're supposed to be doing. And all of that can lead to the cancellation of your registration. Um, we are running short on time, so I just want to be really quick right now. A risk-based approach. What does a risk-based approach really mean? It means you need to sit down as an organization and decide where uh, my where is my biggest risk. This is not a costly exercise. You do not need to hire a professional to do it. You can Google it, and it will tell you what are the risks involved as to nonprofit organizations. The FATF have actually issued documents, and I was going to share it before, but I didn't want to confuse everybody. I feel that they had to read this. This is like a 141-page document, but I will share it eventually, and you will all get it, and you can feel free to read it. However, please bear in mind that that is an extremely high-level document meant to deal with, um, it's meant to capture charitable organizations that collect millions and millions and millions, like, you know, Bill, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and people like them. So don't get too... Um, overwhelmed by what it's saying there. A risk-based approach means exactly what it is. What is my risk? Who am I dealing with? How do I do business? What bank do I use? Am I dealing in a lot of cash? Do I collect a lot of cash from people? Is this grocery that is in my um, community that sponsors my cricket team questionable? And do people often raise questions about the owner of this person? Has he been arrested before for having um, an undisclosed amount of cash on his premises? And do I need to be wary of the fact that he's making donations and buying my cricket uniform every, every um, season? And because of that, I have to be wary that this man is actually laundering his money through my organization. That's a risk assessment in, in a nutshell right there. Right, so it does not have to be costly. And what are the benefits? Um, this slide really just talks about, and and you can, um, I'll take an, I'll come back to this one, but it, the registration requirements, your renewal, your risk assessment, as I said before, your record keeping requirements, and audit. Audit. Let me just touch on audit. Um, audit would be one of the more um, costly aspects of this entire thing, and it 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 does cause a lot of. Um, 
discomfort when when we tell people that they must have an audit it did the same thing with the non-financial businesses and it's going to happen now as well you basically but it's also it, it the act and this is the, the protection i guess that was put in place so it's only where your gross annual income exceeds 10 million dollars you must have audited financials in accordance with ifrs annually where annually qualified auditor and when that audit is done um you have to submit it to the controller of the nonprofit organization who will then file it with the registrar general right now that is important for you to understand again that's how the country's risk-based approach was taken into effect we say well, look we can't ask every every little community organization to go and do our audit at, at, at pricewaterhouse right what you need to do is if you are crossing a certain threshold you do an audit but your record keeping requirements under section 13 are um apply to everybody so what that does is it gives the supervisor, the FIU, and even the Registrar General, when you come to renew your, um, your, your registration and so on, the ability to ensure that you are actually keeping proper records. You don't have to go through the expensive audit process if you are smaller and you below that gross annual income of $10 million, but you must keep proper records. Now, people find that record keeping um, is really, uh, again, costly and, and time consuming and you know, I know people who run entire law firms, law practices, and they don't have proper records. So it is something, it is uh, clients is when I go in to do training for them. Look at the benefits. Look at how you get the most out of your dollars and cents that you're going to invest in your record keeping and see how best you can um, work with it. So yeah, audits will be a cost if you're a large institution, record keeping. Um, you might have to hire additional staff because sometimes you have to have a designated person. If you are a, a, a really active charitable organization or NPO, you may have to hire someone and pay them. It's not just about volunteering anymore because there are so many requirements. You might have to have like a permanent person in your office or whatever it is as a secretary to be able to do these functions. You will have to invest in training for that person. But look at the benefits. You could avoid the state intervention, the loss of your license. I don't know if anybody's ever been through a BIR audit. I haven't, but I've had clients who had it. It ain't, it ain't fun. And it's actually more costly, right? When you have to go through an audit. So remember, as a company, as a nonprofit company, you still have to have your proper records and so on in place. And you should have financials. And if BIR, because a lot of NPOs apply to become tax exempt. And if they feel that you are doing business, that, that something is untoward, and they decide that they are coming to audit you, you're going to have um, uh, uh, not such a nice time in dealing with that. So if you are actually complying with the Nonprofit Organizations Act and you spend the money upfront to invest in proper record keeping and, and financials and so on, you can actually avoid that. So that's the benefits. Um, being better organized. This is a huge one for NPOs. You have no idea. People always talk about the United Nations, but apart from the United Nations, there are tons of organizations out there willing to give money to nonprofit organizations for whatever cause you could find your cause could be you know saving this special one um type of bug that you find only in this particular tree in ue and as your cause and you could find a society somewhere in the world i will say hey we'll give you a grant to go and study that particular kind of bug um because they could go extinct and we want to help you save that bug right and the only way you're going to be able to access that kind of funding I'm being a little facetious here, but that, that the only way you can access funding from any organization, local or international, is if you are properly organized. Habitat for Humanity, excellent example of that. They are so well organized, structured. They have um, really good systems in place. And so they give and access funding very easily internationally because of how well organized they are. If you comply, with this act and even go beyond this act and you really have your house in order you can grow from a very small group of friends who get together in your community to just do charitable work into a massive um meaningful organization that can access funding for projects from you could fix the bridge that's fallen down in your community with the amount of financing you can probably um uh, you know access from an international organization you could start large farming projects in your communities because there are organizations that will do these things but you must have audited accounts you must be structured in a way that you are in compliance with all of your laws you must do all of those things so this is not just about satisfying the state that you have complied there is a benefit that can accrue to you and of course avoiding criminal sanctions for everybody involved in the club is always a benefit um the controller most importantly because as i've read for you there there are serious repercussions um for the controller and so you um, really ought to, to be able to um, do that and to comply with it. And then you move on from there. 
Um, I, I don't have any more slides, but I really want to designate uh, some time now to ask questions. I think Deborah is filtering out the questions and she would pose them to me and I'm going to try my absolute best to answer them. Um, Deborah? We have quite a few questions. Okay. Do cooperatives fall under the Act? Another question is what about NGOs registered before the Act and a third question is, can control can the controller be changed over time? Um, right, okay, so let's deal with that one first then with the controller. The controller can be changed over time. Um, of course, the law must um, make provision for those things, but the, uh, you must inform the Registrar General and so on. There's a, in the law, let me find the actual section and point it to you. Um, that you must update them on changes such as um, uh, updating the register, update the register. Right, a change of particulars under section 15.1, the controller shall notify the RG in the form prescribed of rules of any change in particulars referred to in section 5.4 within 30 days. So even if the, the person changes uh, under section 15 of the act, the new controller must advise the registrar general Yes, so even if the person is changed, then you would um, you must inform the Registrar General of the change. So yes, it's possible to change the person over time. You must cater for people retiring, leaving, unfortunately dying, all of those things. Um, the other question was, does it apply to cooperatives? Um, when you say cooperatives, I think you, any, any organization that is registered under the Cooperative Societies Act is treated as what we call a credit union in Trinidad. Um, and you are actually already captured under the Proceeds of Crime Act as a financial institution. So you are not a nonprofit organization. You are captured as a, as a, um, under that act. I know that there's a distinction between a cooperative society and the, um, and the credit unions, but I believe under Proceeds of Crime, um, subject to correction, that all, um, all societies registered under the Cooperative Societies Act are already um captured for this anti-money laundering regime so you're not actually captured as a non-profit you're captured before that and you was registered before the act um yeah so basically we had no form of registration for NPOs per se before this law what you had were people being incorporated under the companies act or unincorporated entities operating or you had um people who were incorporated by statute and so, um, yes, any, any entity that's operating at present um, as a non-profit and where you fall into the definition of a non-profit organization within the act, you would, actually, um, you would actually be captured. Let me just tell you the section of the law, if you want to read it, it's section 27 of the act. It says subject to subsection two, a non-profit organization other than a non-profit company which was operational immediately before the date of commencement of the act, may continue to carry out its activities without registration for a period of 18 months or such longer period as the minister may by order um, determine, um, provided that that does not ex exceed 12 months. So there's a, a window of opportunity. So if you are incorporated on a company's act, this doesn't apply to you. Eh? You must get into, into gears and start complying. But like I said, the, the time period has been extended because of COVID. But um, generally speaking, if you were like a, a non registered, not registered under the Companies Act, and you had been operating like a regular community organization, just getting together, totally unincorporated group of persons, you do have that window of opportunity where you can um, get into get into gear with it. Um, and it said that before the expiration of that time, of course, you can apply for an extension of time. Um, and where you had been exempt from taxes and so on before, you must comply and give the Registrar General a copy of that um, of that uh, document um, because you know that there's a process, I guess most of you all would know there's a little process involved where you can actually make an application to become tax exempt from the Ministry of Finance. All nonprofit organizations um, uh, can do that. Of course, it's a lengthy process. You have to, again, have your audited financials and so on in order, but it is possible to get it done. So that's the, the state of affairs as, as it exists for persons who are, um, who are in existence at the time. Once an NPO is already registered under the Companies Act, there's no need to re-register under, uh, under the NPO Act. How does this affect the disclosure, um, which was not required under the Companies Act and so on? Okay, so all that means really, it is 
you aren't required to register again because you're you you are already incorporated as a nonprofit company so you're already deemed to be registered so you're going on the register because remember under the act now the company the registrar general is going to compile a register so the registration requirement is to capture the people who aren't registered on the company's act so that they get onto the register so when the company's registrar now has a full register she's going to have the people who incorporated on the company's act and all the other people as well that's the, that's the only that's the only distinction because you had people who she will know about and you have people out there who she don't know about so the process of registration is so the people who she doesn't know about to come into the system, right? Everything else after that, in terms of complying with the requirements under the act, applies to you. The controller must be appointed. They still have to do the same things. You still have to do your risk assessment. You still have to fill out your AML CFT questionnaire. You still have to do um, your risk assessment questionnaire. You still have to do your record keeping, all of that. None of that is affected. Um, you asked also, what are the practical uh, what are the practical steps to ensure compliance? Is there a form to be filled out and submitted? Um, every so often, I know, for example, NPO is grossing, I need to be audited. What are the compliance requirements for NPO not falling in this category? Right. So, well, I think I, I spoke about that. The requirements is basically your record keeping requirement. That's the most important one. Um, in terms of a form to be filled out, you must do the AML CFT risk assessment questionnaire and submit that within 12 months of the act coming into force. Um, as I said, it's been extended, so don't get too anxious because this act came into force um, in 2019. Let me just check. Yeah, April 2019. So the 12 months have long gone, but they have extended the time because of the fact that um, we had COVID and all of that. And I think they recognize as well that people need a little more time to get um, walk around with the legislation and, and the requirements. But um, practically speaking, what you need to do is you need to make sure your operations are more in line with um, a corporation. You have to have designated people to do things and there's no way to get around that. It's, it's unfortunate because we feel that that might be um, sometimes unfair to NPUs who are just trying to do really good work. And you know, lots of NPUs are just doing that and they're functioning on minimal, like really bare bones funding. But you do have to be organized in a way, um, study your legislation, understand what is required, um, you know, and then just take it one step at a time. Nobody is coming to shut you down as an NPO. And well, I, let me, I should not say that, but I don't think anybody will come and shut you down as an NPO if it takes you a little longer than everybody else to get your record keeping in, in gay, all right? But um, let me give you an example. I did a lot of work with a small credit union that's based at a church. And this thing started up because they just really wanted to facilitate loans to their members because they, they serve a very um, rural and, 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 and uh, at the time downtrodden community. And um, that's how they got started, but they grew a little bit more. And because of the whole anti-money laundering regime, they became captured. And they had a file in cabinet with a few files in it. And that was their record keeping system. And they really had to just kind of get on board. They had to develop specific forms that they will use to capture data about their members. They had to um, because again, as I said, you need to know who your members are. You need to know who they are affiliated with. You need to know what organizations they belong to. Sometimes, as I said, it's something as basic as a cricket club. You don't know if the man playing cricket with you in the cricket club um, also belongs to some fundamentalist type of religious organization. And every time he asks the cricket club to um, have a fat match and raise money for the child that need a wheelchair in that organization, <laughs> it's really being diverted to some other level. So knowing who your members are, knowing where the money is going, not utilizing cash. I cannot stress that enough as a money laundering professional or even as an attorney, the risk of cash is so great and it causes scrutiny. I don't know if you all are aware of it right now and there's been a lot of it in the news and DSS and all of that, but anytime you are found with excess of $20,000 in cash, which is not a lot of money at all in this day and age, you can actually have that cash seized by the police for up to 72 hours and they can get a court order for three months after that to keep it to, to um, investigate the proceeds of that cash if they have reasonable grounds to suspect that it comes from some sort of criminal activity. And it's not hard to convince the court that they need time to do an investigation. And that happens a lot in this country. Um, I have personally said that I think $20,000 is too low. My doubles man making that on a good Saturday morning. 
Um, and the fact is that people like, like that, they do cash business. Um, so I think the threshold ought to be raised, but the fact of the matter is the threshold is $20,000 right now. So if you have a, a barbecue to raise money and you have a lot of cash, don't hold on to this cash and start paying for things in cash and start giving out money to people in cash. When you use checks and you use banks, as much as I, I'm not a fan of banks, but they serve a purpose. There is a record. There's an electronic record and there's a way that if the police need to investigate you or they need to look into something that, that everything can be, um, can be looked at from a, you know, through um, a formal banking channel. So that has to be done. Um, a lot of the other questions now, let me just wrap up really quickly. Um, Dr. McPhee, um, do you have any other questions and specifically that you would like me to address? Yes, do you think this is overkill for a small NGO community like ours? And are formally audited accounts necessary for an, M an NPO? Right. And will the bylaws of the organization have to be amended so that the rules and procedures can be reconciled with the NPO Act? Well, okay, so that's a good question. Um, I mean, bylaws are essentially very fluid things that the organization come up with for themselves. So if there are things in your bylaws, for example, that do not require for example, record keeping in line with section 13 of the act, you may need to amend your bylaws, right? Um, so, you know, that to keep proper financial records or, or that sort of thing, you may also wish to amend your bylaws to make provision for that position of controller, because that is a legal requirement that you have a controller. And the law excludes, as I went through in the presentation, certain people who ought not to be controller and that kind of thing. But you can also set your own standards as to who you wish to be controller so that not any and everybody could jump up on any club and say, well, ah, it's my turn to be controller because it should not work that way, really, right? Um, so yeah, amendments to bylaws, it's not, a it's not a legal requirement that you amend your bylaws, but I would think that that's certainly advisable that you do that. Um, in terms of the um, audit, uh, it's, and, and this is where, and this can, we can tie this back into the overkill point. Is it overkill for a small NGO community like ours? Um, this is why I went through from the top down of how FATF will view us. It may be. And this is a Peter pays for Paul and Paul pays for all scenario. It's, it's unfortunate that nonprofit organizations have been abused to facilitate money laundering and terrorist financing. But it has happened. It has come. In, it has come to pass. 9/11 was a consequence of it. Other terrorist activity that takes place around the world, every roadside bomb that go off that you hear about, it's funded somewhere. Those things ain't cheap, right? It's funded and it's funded through an organization. So every country in the world, unless you want to be on an FATF blacklist and want nobody else to do business with you, you're required to pass laws like this, and you're required to ensure that people are complying with it. How we try to minimize the risk and minimize the impact on small NGOs is by saying, look, FIU isn't really going to um, be um, down on you if you're earning less than $500,000 a year in your gross income. Um, they have also limited the audits. So this comes back to the audit question. Unless you are grossing over $10 million, you don't have to do that IFRS compliance audit, but you do have to comply with the record keeping. So section 13 and 14 of the NPO Act, look at it. The, there's no limit as to who must do the record keeping, but there is a limit in place in terms of who must do the, um, the audits. And that really is to minimize the impact on the smaller NPOs. Um, it, it, it is what it is. Um, as I said, different people had different positions on this. It was very contentious. Um, when it went to parliament because of the impact on NPOs, a lot of people felt like it was overkill and it would not be in the best interest. It could actually cause people and discourage people from forming NPOs, which serve the community and serve such a valuable purpose. But, um, you know, when you, you have to weigh that against the, um, the, the, the backlash you can get from international sanctions. That's the best way I can answer that question. Banks are not offering card facilities to NPOs. So any international payments that has to be made by NPOs, um, it, it becomes very complicated. Com international payments for services often have to be made by a member of the organization. Then that member is reimbursed. Is there something under the act that can address this? No, 
um, that that's actually not a legal requirement, or it has nothing to do with the NPO Act. That is actually the bank. Um, that's their policy because just like you have to have a risk assessment and you have to determine um, levels of risk and so on, the banks also have to do that. And the banks, a lot of the banks have um, deemed that nonprofit organizations are high risk business. And so they don't issue cards to, to, to NGOs. Even if you have a bank account, you will have a checking account that you can write checks locally, um, but they would not issue you with a credit card just like that because of the fact that NPOs can be used for abuse. Passing this law, actually, and if we operationalize it and more NPOs become registered and are more compliant with this act, could actually result in banks um, being more flexible with NPOs. So that's another benefit that you can look at. Um, the, the NPO sector was completely unregulated before. So the, the banks would not, um, would not issue cards and, and do certain types of, even if you wanted to do a wire transfer, you would have a really hard time as an NPO before. Now, if you were to go to the bank, um, a bank that you've been doing business with for a number of years, and you say to them, well, listen, I'm not registered under the NPO Act. I have my compliance things in order. I have um, my, all my record keeping is there. The FIU have actually done a site visit. They say, I go, I, da, da, da. you might actually get a lot more flexibility from the bank. But the law, this law, doesn't actually address that. It doesn't have anything to do with that. It has, um, that's, that's banking policies. And um, well, I guess, I don't know, that that could be something that a group of NGOs probably, now that the law is in place, can raise with the Bankers Association, BAT, and um, raise, raise that issue with them, whether or not they will ease up the restrictions and the requirements for nonprofit organizations now that the law is in place. Does a religious body incorporated in 1989 under the Companies Act and has re-registered under the NPO Act of 2019, are they also required to apply for registration? If you were, um, if you were registered before under the Companies Act, then you aren't required, if you were incorporated under the Companies Act, then you are automatically deemed to be registered under the Nonprofit Organizations Act. So you don't have to re-register, but you have to comply because religious organizations are captured by the definition of nonprofit organization. So you do have to, um, uh, you know, uh, comply with all the requirements of the NPO Act, that's the 2019 Act, but you don't necessarily have to register if you were previously registered under the Companies Act. If you were, for example, like the um, Presbyterian Church of Trinidad and Tobago was incorporated by Act of Parliament, um, and and I, I mentioned Sir Optimus, some of our older clubs and so on. If you were in, if you were um, incorporated in that way, then you have to re-register, and then comply with all the other things. But registration under the Companies Act um, automatically means you're registered on the MPO Act. And the reason I, I again I gave that to you as an example is that the company's registry must have a complete list of all NPOs. So if you're already registered in Companies Registry as nonprofit, they know about you. You don't have to re-register. It's the ones they don't know about that have to come back and register so that they get a complete list and a complete picture of all who are MPUs in the country. So one more, I think this would have to be our last question. There was an extension for filing until August 30th, until March 31st, sorry. 31st, right? right, but I have the business saying, I haven't seen anything from legal affairs extending the time to file the risk assessment questionnaire after the last extension, which ended on the 30th of September, 2020. I think, sure. Um, no, I think all of those documents have to be filed together because your risk assessment must actually be filed together with your registration documents. So if you are, um, let me just get it here. When you are, yeah, I think the risk assessment is to be filed. As well. I, I, I would have to check on that to see if the companies, the ones that, are, the ones that don't have to register, because you're already registered on the Companies Act, I'm not certain if the risk assessment questionnaire extension was given as well. Um, that's one I'll have to check on, um, and I can check on it for you um, from Legal Affairs. I mean, look, generally speaking, it's a risk assessment. It's not a, um, there's no real um, penalty attached to that clause. I, I mean, of course, there's a general power to impose penalties and so on. But what I would say is that um, get your risk assessment questionnaire done as soon as possible and um, submit it. If you are registered under the Companies Act, you should not delay in doing so. Um, I see somebody ask about whether materials and resources are available for training and all of that. Um, the FIU has outreach sessions every so often for the nonprofit sector. So make the FIU website your best friend. Look out for uh, NPO 
um, information, their compliance department, once you um, once they're aware that you exist, they have an email database and they blast out emails um, to you on at different times and they will send information on the training, but look out for their stuff on their website and look out for some of the documents they put out there. I've tried to download some of them and share them as well um, from the FIU website. The FATF documents, I will share them, but again, please don't get overwhelmed by it. It's a lot of information. It's very, very, very high level because like I said, they are dealing with massive um, charitable organizations that operate in different countries and across borders and, and things like that. So that might be way over the head of almost like 99.9% .9 of our charitable organizations and NGOs in Trinidad. So, but I will share them so that you can have a look and see what the thinking is if you like to read. I have to say first, thank you very much. Senator Lodge Medial for spending time with us. If we were in the seminar room, you'll get a round of applause. Is there somewhere we can give a round of applause and on, on Zoom? Um, you've really shared with us an expansive amount of information. Um, for the participants, we will post the seminar on the IGDS Facebook page. Uh, we will continue to share the documents that uh, Senator Lodge Medial uh, shared with us. I would just like to say a special thanks going, going out to Marcus Kisun, Lucidi Legault, uh, Tanisha and Asha of the IGDS admin. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, Senator Lashpadia, let me give you the last word now, please. Go ahead. Sure. And it's just Jansi, everybody. It's Jansi in this forum. Um, <laughs> and thank you. You know, I really enjoy this. This is um, an area that I really enjoy talking about as you can well i like to talk about anything so um that's why i'm a lawyer and politician but it's um it's this is an area that i really really enjoy um it's interesting it's very you know it's it's i think it's important for people to understand the law uh, how they can comply with it it is a work in progress as well that's why laws are amended all the time sometimes things aren't working my advice to everyone do not get overwhelmed by these things, um, it's possible to get yourself into compliance. And of course, there are always avenues for redress. I see somebody asked about reasons of re refusing registration and things like that. All of those things are really high level legal matters and I could not get into it in this amount of time. But, um, you know, it's always, um, those avenues exist. It is a legal matter now in terms of your, your requirements under the law. I encourage everyone to comply with the law. I encourage everyone to also communicate with your representatives and so on and, and through your through different avenues if you have challenges with complying with the law and what your views are because you have to live it. When you live it and you experience it and you work in, in a system where you, you go through the law and you work with the law, then you are best placed. So, um, you know, get together as, as, as organizations and communicate, write letters, write to, to the Registrar General, to the Attorney General, to anybody, and tell them what are your challenges with the law and how you feel about it and what you think can be done better. So that's my advice. And thank you all so, so very much. I really enjoy this. Um, I wish we could be together and do it. It would be more interactive. Um, hopefully soon, vaccine coming, we'll do more of this. And I'm always open to having um, another session and to go more into this if anybody wants to. Um, so I'll, I'll find the time.